Welcome to the high bar. Cheers. Great job, Eddie. <laughs> Did you write that down on a piece of paper? Your weekly watering hole for lighthearted conversation with people who care about culture that matters. I'm Warren Etheridge, your host and barkeep. I promise never to cut anyone off while encouraging all to think responsibly. It's just like you have to really listen, right. you know? Like... Good question, you know? <laughs> I, but that kind of was. That's yeah. a good question. Join me today at the fabulous Lobby Bar in Seattle, Washington, as I welcome award-winning documentarian Sandy Siafi as we raise a toast to and raise the bar for justifying film education. Filmmaking. Is that a real profession for adults? <laughs> well, you know, first of all, of course, everyone's going to say film. Mm -hmm. You know, no more film. I mean, every other joke at the Academy Awards was about renaming the Kodak Theater. Um, but Yes, it is a real career for adults, but right now we're in this really crazy flux about what it means to get paid for it. Mm -hmm. But if we were to take every profession that's up for grabs about getting paid for and say it's not real, we would be talking about a lot of phantom professions that we really care about. I think it's more a question of where does content creation fall in a world where the economy isn't just in stress, it's in complete reconfiguration. So, I mean, I think it's a really fascinating thing to ask filmmakers, well, you spend tons of money on gear. All filmmakers find a way to buy their cameras and their editing machines, so those companies are doing well. And then all the companies that sell things to consume the film on are doing well. The big TV, the theaters right. themselves are even doing better than people thought they would by 2012. And yet the people in the middle, the ones who make the stuff to put up there, with the very small exception, but even, even the larger industry is sort of hurting. So the content creation is in a real uh, state of flux in terms of being a remunerative profession. So um, that being said, it, it doesn't mean that we should give over to the idea that the only people who are going to tell our stories are trust fund babies. Right. I mean, not that some trust fund babies might not tell wonderful stories, but they shouldn't be the only people in a position to do so. Well, there, and I, I think part of it is that phrase, content creation, which mm -hmm. al already seems so commercialized in some way to yeah. me, like we're creating content. I mean, some of it can be art at times. A some show like The is. High Bar, frankly. I, as, as well, we should discuss high, <laughs> high art and the high bar <laughs> in, the right. same, in the same sure. breath. Yeah, not only can some of it be art, it should be. And, I mean, we've allowed, and by we, I guess I'll say sort of progressive cultural thinkers, we've allowed um, the seeding of the ground, we've seeded over the conversation to the idea that we have to justify everything as something in the marketplace. Instead of talking about that great civilizations have always had a really terrific tension between the marketplace, the cultural space, the critics of that space, it, not every need is a marketplace need. In, right. in fact, there's that great, um, there's that great saying, the king should pay for Mardi Gras lest he be beheaded. There's, there used to be a better understanding that arts and culture are a part of any society that you should care about and pay for. And it's not just because you're a good guy, but because in the long run we all have a, a better life. So yeah, of course it's art and should therefore be supported. Yeah, I'm one of those people who actually thinks that. <laughs> well, I don't know about the king, but there was a time where we couldn't even get the president to rebuild New Orleans, <laughs> let alone pay for Mardi Gras, for yeah. goodness sakes. No, that's right. So <laughs> there's a With, problem. Without forcing New Orleans to become all charter schools, by the way. It was one of the provisos in order to get your money back. And uh, one of the others was most arts in the schools were eliminated. Just oh. an interesting connection to our conversation. <laughs> That's right. Because, because that doesn't get the, get the kids jobs. That's part of, you know, well, we can't be teaching them art and music. I mean, after all, they're not going to get a job doing that. That's mm -hmm. the thinking. And that's part of the reason we're talking about this is because, uh, like all state-supported institutions, Seattle Central Community College is facing its own crisis of, of financing, and a lot of cuts have been suggested, and uh, the film department, the film program, or the media program, if we'll call it that, uh, there is imperiled. Yes. And, and should it be? Absolutely not. And let's start with this. One of the really pernicious things about a bad budget environment is that everyone is sloppy intellectually and says, oops, it's just the budget. Right. And in fact, there are many agendas that are going on, um, some of which I think are unconscious on, on the part of even some of the key players, about the reconfiguration of what it means to run a two-year public institution. So if you are interested in, which I think we could say Republicans over the last 30 years would be happy to report they were interested in dismantling 
public support for education. Right. In fact, they're proud of that. Um, our opponents are very clear about their vision. They don't believe that states should be in the business of paying for community colleges. Okay? Um, they've been in invested in that agenda. So when you look at where we are now and you say, well, the budget's terrible, so after all, things are going to have to get cut. I really challenge everyone to ask whether or not that's so true. First of all, whether or not it's true that all these things have to be cut. Secondly, whether or not it's true that that's even why they're being cut. Bad budgets form this dark shield under which a lot of other things happen. So it's, it's not meant to be a, um, some kind of deep conspiracy because that would require a certain amount of sort of strategic planning, which isn't even what I think is going on. I think that there are some unconscious agendas being dealt with. And I also think that it's, it's possible that the college is slowly giving way to the notion of being a place that is really for transfer education, meaning you take an English class, a math class, then you go to the UW, or training you directly for a job. So here's how to put on a solar panel. Here's how to cook dinner in a restaurant. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great. But it used to be the case that the college mission was to do those two things as well as right. full liberal arts education, continuing ed, basic studies, ESL. The idea was you walk in the door and you access it at whatever level you want to access it and you move around and among those programs. That was so successful that we had to do something to dismantle it. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I don't mean to sound cynical, but it's really hard not to be cynical when you look at the return on investment of programs like film and video. It isn't just about a student graduates gets B job. There are so many, so many areas of payback to the community that, that we'll probably talk about that are an extraordinary return on the dollar. Well, let, let, let's go into that because mm -hmm. I, I agree with you on the budget thing in, in the sense that uh, you can't just look at it, we have no money, we can't support anything. Mm -hmm. Obviously, hard choices have to be made. Mm -hmm. But this idea of return on investment is very important mm -hmm. because you can you say like a filmmaker gets this education and actually goes out and makes a living? particularly here in Seattle, can you say that? And, and, and this, mm -hmm. what you're alluding to, that there's greater value to the community, what is that? So we'll start with your first question. So first of all, yes, in, in some cases, people get their degree and they go out and they get a job. That actually does happen. Right. Don't, as, don't tell the crew. <laughs> as, as much as people <laughs> seem to be incredulous that this is true, we actually have a good deal of our graduates go out and get jobs. The state captures data about what those numbers look like. And um, you know, I think it's a matter of public record that the state says that 40% of our graduates get hired. Mm -hmm. And they consider that a terrible number. Right. I think it's really interesting because I consider that a terrific number when you consider our industry and where we are and how we're reconfiguring, coming back, trying to figure out what those jobs look like. So 40% hard data means you also have a slew of people working freelance jobs, putting together a living, figuring out ways to be on independent projects that really work for them. They're also generating, um, they're also generating income in the economy and quality of life in the community by doing things like buying their cameras here, editing here, going to restaurants here, showing their films here, speaking at high schools here. All of that activity is an outgrowth of what we're doing. The integration of the education at film and video was critical to how we approached it. It wasn't just, I teach you a software program. If I do that, the value of what I did is gone in 10 minutes. Um, you can just go get a tutorial. But instead, if I teach you how to edit, then you're a lifelong learner who can go on and, and retool over and over. And then more importantly, if I've attached to that editing a meaningful relationship to storytelling, to who you are in your community, there's a whole league of things that you're now doing that aren't just about, I go to work at Como, even though some of our graduates go to work at Como. So I think there's um, maybe a sort of tragic misunderstanding, even among the people who are in power, about the value of what we do and how far those tentacles reach. How many nonprofits our people make PSAs for? How many, I mean, we could go on and on in terms of what our graduates are doing. I think one thing they're doing that's really worth noting, if you look at the last top 20 permitted films in Seattle, we had graduates on all of them. These are films that are now really breaking through. You talk about this on your show all the time. We, something is happening. We finally are seeing the convergence of the strength of the software, gaming, intellectual property industries in Seattle, and now that with traditional storytelling media, we are seeing a rebirth of that kind of scene here. Our graduates are front and center in that. Now is hardly the time to stop doing that kind of a, by the way, very affordable, affordable both to the student and the state very bad timing to pull that back. It will actually cost more in the long run than it will save. Well, we can talk about the potential conspiratorial element of that in a second. Mm -hmm. But 
the film program is not alone. There are other mm -hmm. programs that are jeopardized here, mm -hmm. right? What are those programs? In the last year, the student newspaper was cut. The mm -hmm. journalism program attached to it was cut. A program called Publishing Arts that was actually... See if you can find a pattern here. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually reconfiguring to also be a digital media management program, mm -hmm. which there's a lot of employment in this area, so that was interesting. It sort of knocks the employment argument. Um, so Publishing Arts Interpreter Training, mm -hmm. um, us, and I think I've got I think I've got everyone right now. Oh, the um, optometry program had to do what's called going to self-support, which basically means the students pay all the fees of their every amount of the payment that's required comes from them, not the state. They cover their own their own butt own in every program. way. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was right. looking for a better way to say it. Um, <laughs> and the um, uh, early parenthood education program has been cut entirely. The daycare that used to be at the college has been cut. So those things, you know, to not muddy an argument. There, you made this point. Yes, the budget to the college was diminished over the last three years quite substantially. But when you say, well, now wait a minute, if you're in charge of that budget and you look at the mission of the college and you look at what programs are sitting there healthy, and by healthy I would mean full enrollment, mm -hmm. solid curriculum that's been given, thumbs up by accrediting agencies, a lot of people don't know till it's too late the kind of money that is invested in things like a program that you can fully transfer to another college with that takes sometimes decades to get put together. Um, so when you look at all that and you say, well now wait a minute, these are healthy programs, that's actually a precedent. We've never seen fully enrolled healthy programs cut at this college, a college that has a national reputation as being one of the best in the country. It's never happened before. So you have to say to yourself now, wouldn't you only do that if you quite literally had no other choice whatsoever? I would argue that there were other choices. Well, surely, surely the school looked at, at the bottom line mm -hmm. and just went after the programs that made the least money or that cost them the most, right? I mean, I don't mean to be cheeky. I right. think that I would really enjoy someone pushing them on answering that question because the college has not properly answered these questions. But you're privy to some of that information. Mm -hmm. I'm you, privy to you, what they said. <clears throat> right. But what do, you, what do you believe? I mean, like if it was that thing, like we've set the line, that's where it's got to go, mm -hmm. and that's what they did, they would have some argument. Is that what you think would happen? Or do you think there are other programs that cost them more that are safe? Oh, well, I know for a fact that they published a spreadsheet of mm -hmm. their cost, and there are programs like nursing that are three times the cost of film and video. Um, you know, I understand that you can make an argument. This is where it gets crazy. This is like the Lord of the Flies way of running a community college. I mean, I don't want to go out there and slam Piggy and stomp on his glasses either, right. okay? The, the fact is healthy programs are a part of the mission of the college, and they shouldn't, faculty shouldn't be sitting there duking out who's more legitimate. That's craziness. So it would um, make a good reality TV program. Yes, as a matter, as a matter of fact, course. it would. Yes, <laughs> but, and it's kind of happening right now. I mean, right. we're, we're going to see more and more of it. It's, uh, it has a real stultifying effect. Um, the cost of that is very substantial, of having colleagues become more and more balkanized. And we see it. It's happening. People are actually, you know how there's that human nature thing, you want to feel better, and you want to assume it can't happen to you if you're a good kid. So you retreat into this even less sort of um, less aggressive, less advocacy for students, less pushing. Things that in a bureaucracy have always been required of any good faculty. If your students are going to get a good education, you have to be a fighter. Huh. So yeah, I guess to not put too fine a point on it, I think film and video was, um, there was a savory idea of cutting it in that some of the faculty, not just myself, have been very much student advocates, have really pushed for the program. And getting rid of such an annoying voice might be savory in a bad budget <laughs> environment. I, I don't want to pull punches about that. I think that's possible. So I, like Jaws 2, this time it's personal? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I, think, I, I think that part of, it, yeah. um, part of it could be personal. Yeah, I've been a fairly outspoken union leader, and I don't think the administration has enjoyed that. And I think, but let's be more serious about something. Students, 50 students a year shouldn't pay that price. Right. And if there is a way for the film and video program to remain open with no red ink to the college, wouldn't it be incumbent upon the college to do that? Shouldn't the community that has invested for 26 years, by the way, in this program, a program that I think you know the film community will tell you is greatly respected and has tr you know, tremendous reputation. If a business were looking at this, this is what makes me crazy about the free market people. If a business looked at the film and video program, they would give it an enormously high valuation. But instead, you have someone saying, well, in order to save what arguably can't be more than $30,000 a year, we're going to cut it. 
um, because we don't see it as an asset that was invested in by Washington State taxpayers all these years, that just doesn't make any kind of sense. So uh, we, the faculty, did propose this fall a sort of radical restructure so that we would actually make the college a little bit of money, partially because we cannot figure out why they're closing us. Right. Um, that, I mean, it was a very sincere attempt to say, hey, look, all professional technical programs are about to face this dilemma. So why don't we go to the film community at large, which is really pretty fantastic in this town, use all of our graduates who are out there and doing what they're doing, our current students, our faculty, and together figure out how to reconfigure in a way that will cost even less than we do now, even though we're not in the top five most expensive programs in the college. Well, is, is there something going on uh, on a bigger scale, not just in, at, at the school, but within this film community? Because they're having the argument now with Washington Filmworks and, and mm -hmm. whether or not they will continue to be funded. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's been one of those no-brainer things. It's like a program that doesn't really cost the state anything and essentially brings in lots of money, brings in lots of jobs. Seems to be exactly what we need at, at times like this. Yes. But there is r tremendous resistance. And let's, and let's add to that. I agree with everything you're saying. Let's add to that, that term that people who work in business and marketing enjoy so much branding. The right. Seattle brand is in question here. Washington State slash Seattle in particular, at Seattle Community College on the corner of Broadway and Pine, we have had this deep tradition of all kinds of media education programs. And that's you know the value of saying, I'm moving to that town because of these things. I'll spend this much money on a piece of carrot cake because of these <laughs> things. How you actually get good data to prove that is another question. But again, we've ceded ground to the wrong framework of the conversation. We allowed that the only framework is what you can prove in dollars brought in when there are so very many, I mean, you know, not that the book is the only answer to this, but the rise of the creative class way back, Richard mm -hmm. Florida, right? Mm -hmm. You know, really discussing the long-term and downstream impact of having that kind of a creative community. We do. And it, it will, unfortunately, one of those things is, you know, it's the pave paradise problem. People won't understand what we've lost until it's gone. They won't get it. Um, so I'm trying to frame the argument instead of save this program, I'm trying to say, let's redo professional technical programs with a new, instead of that horrible term, which is, comes from the state board, and talk about that, uh, them as more of a creative commons. And they are the kind of place, every study now shows that we're likely to shift jobs anywhere between five and 10 times. So we can't just talk about a student getting trained in solar panels. That's fine, that's a skill set. But if a student wants to take the kind of program with the kind of comprehensive creative commons we're talking about, and they can move in and around in the future, the value to the city and the state is also this um, intangible branding that I, I just think doesn't get talked about enough. So yes, it's a common theme. It's our, again, our adversaries being very clear about what they want and our own allies not understanding in some ways the value of what we do or knowing how to articulate it, and they're not fighting for it. They see it as a difficult thing to fight for, so they go and they grab even some of the very best allies on most issues. They'll just grab a thing they know they can use, a piece of data, and say, see, if I teach students nursing, they all go get this job at this number, so you'll fight for me politically, right? I mean, honestly, it's a lack of political will in the long run and a lack of vision. Well, you're also talking about like some things that where you have uh, a lack of data, uh, mm -hmm. poor data, or mm -hmm. just a lot of intangibles. I mean, when you're talking about branding, yes. that's a hard thing to actually put numbers mm -hmm. to. But there, there are so many elements to what you're saying. And mm -hmm. one of the ones that intrigues me is this idea that we'll change jobs five to 10 times or mm -hmm. something. And what has been seemingly a trend for a long time in this country of specialization. Mm -hmm. You will learn one thing, yep. as if we were still that, yep. this country that somebody went to work for IBM and did so for the entirety of their life. But nobody does that. Nope. And so why would you want to make schools more specialized? Shouldn't you be broader educating all students, giving them more opportunities, having all those things? You, you couldn't, I mean, you couldn't ask a better question. I was listening to the president's speech when he was talking about General Motors and how they retooled the factory. Mm -hmm. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that the president himself is missing something. Mm -hmm. He's exactly right that now a worker there actually knows the entire process of making a car and that's one of the things they've done differently and why they're doing better. That person's no longer, no longer doing a mindless widget. It's not what's happening. There's no more one rivet, right. right? So that person literally knows the entire process of making the car and they have to be multiply intelligent across their day and figure out all kinds of things that they didn't used to have to do. And he's talking about how we have to educate tomorrow's workers. But if we're not gonna hamstring 
community colleges and four-year publicly supported colleges, not hamstring them for another generation. We have to get much bigger right now about stopping all this talk about just job training because we're, we're redoing exactly what got the auto industry in trouble in the first place if we simply say, here's your one skill set. So yes, of course, what everyone can tell you, when, funny enough, when we go to our industry advisors and say, what do you need from our graduates? Do you know what they always say? People who can read and write and be intelligent when they give group presentations, who can present themselves, think on their feet, deal with abstract concepts. They never say, I need Photoshop. Right. I mean, sorry, but you can always find another bloke who knows Photoshop. Everybody can figure out somebody who knows Photoshop and just drive that price down. But having a person who is conversant in the entire arc of storytelling, and they can apply that to some after effects, and they can pre be presentable when they meet with you and ask good questions, boom, you've hit the jackpot. That's how we educated. But that kind of education all across the system is in real jeopardy. I would take those skills on a politician at this point. <laughs> Photoshop? <laughs> no, not Photoshop. No. Some across the board <laughs> skills, some communication skills would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. What, what can people do? How should they educate themselves? What, what is your, your call to action for the audience? Well, some simple direct calls to action. There is an actual online petition that some graduates started, and their hope is that if thousands of people in the Seattle community say this is a gem and it really shouldn't go, not only will that show public pressure, but it will also, it'll also show the public commitment to continue to keep the program open. So that's online. I can give you a link to that. Okay. Um, we, I'm not sure when we're airing, but there's a public forum to have a a more in-depth conversation about some of these very issues that aren't just about our program. As you accurately pointed out, these are questions that really impact the creative community in Seattle and the whole state. Um, and that discussion is Monday, March 5th at the Broadway Performance Hall at 6 p.m. And after that night, I think we're going to try to decide in that room what some future action steps are. Because again, while we really care about trying to save this program from having the doors shuttered, we also care about educating people in an affordable way to have a film. I mean, when you, when you think about it, the next most affordable two-year film program in the area is, I think, $28,000 a year. Our students are paying about $3,700. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, and, and I think we're considered by many to be um, not only a better value, but, but a better education. So it really would be a shame to close the doors. So I would ask that people call the president of the college and say, not only am I asking you to reconsider, but I will be one of the people who supports the program. We, um, we the faculty, have said, we'll pull back on how we're running the program for two years to literally make it impossible for this to go into the red. Right. So that seems like a good offer. Yeah, that um, seems like a good offer. Seems like a good offer. You, you bring up the, the money and the tuition thing, and, mm -hmm. and once again, I want to underscore that because <laughs> the contrast is A lot of people don't know that fairly, number. Fairly yeah. sharp. 28,000 versus 20... About 3,700. 3,700. Right now, okay. yeah, for a full year. University of Washington, also a state-supported mm -hmm. school, uh, has responded to their budget crisis by simply uh, charging yeah. state students out the wazoo yes. uh, comparably. Uh, why not do that at Seattle Central? If, if the only option to keep the film and video program is to go fully self-support, which is to say the students would be paying about $9,000 a year, mm -hmm. while I don't believe that's the best option, I think it's a better option than closing. Mm -hmm. So the, as we push for all of the things we hope could be a better outcome, we'll push for that as well. Um, we can't fathom why you would close it under those circumstances. Right. I believe we will still fill it every year. We, we turn away every year enough students to almost have another whole second section. We've just never had the space for it. So we're, by the way, um, there's been a misconception that our program was flagging or didn't have enough enrollment. We have people on the waiting list every year. Um, so I don't know where that misconception came from. But I, I believe we would still fill without a problem. Again, I don't like that tuition burden, but I know that one of the things the community will double down and do, we will try to figure out a way to have the rest of that be offered a scholarship. We'll do everything we can to make that possible. Okay, one final question for you. Yes. You alluded to the fact that perhaps your political nature, your nature in general, <laughs> may play some role in all of this. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to step away from the program altogether if that would save it? I doubt that the college would offer a quid pro quo of that nature, mm -hmm. but yes, I would. You would? Of course That's I would. That's how important it is. Of course. This program can't close. It, it is, I mean, really, I, you know, it's hard 
to say that this is, you know, it's not a bleeding seal. Right. You know, although I think after my last documentary, I said I'll never make a documentary again without throwing um, an oil-covered dolphin in it, because right. people understand the care for the dolphins. <laughs> um, but I don't know how to express enough. First of all, you know, our program has single moms, more students of color than any other tech program, students who have no way to go to film school. The, the idea then becomes, once again, in a new caste system America, film school is just for privileged kids. We run a terrific program for very little money and really great people who want to tell stories and be part of the culture at large. They go to that program and they do extraordinary work. Many of them have worked with you. You know who I'm talking about. Right. These people don't get to go to film school unless we keep this program open. So if the college wants me to go in order to keep the program open, of course I would. There we go. It's not a bleeding seal, but it's awfully convincing. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Since I'm hosting that event, I plan to work it out that evening at Broadway Performance Hall. We'll get it done. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Filmmaking, whether at the community college level or the statewide industry level, may not be a bleeding seal. Yet it is still well worth saving. And you can help. Visit the website for Washington Filmworks or go to facebook.com slash save SCCC film. Take action before the bean counters yell cut. Cheers. <laughs>